imagine. The story of Pentecost comes to us from the book of the Bible called the Acts of the Apostles. Every year we turn to this reading to listen for God's movement, the movement of the Holy Spirit in our midst. I invite you to open your hearts and your minds and indeed your spirits to this reading of God's word this day. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Eliamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Parphygia and Pamphylia, Egypt's and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken about through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even upon my slaves, both men and women. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I shall show portents in the heaven above and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. And the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And may God bless to us our reading and our understanding and our applying of this word to how we live our lives. I mentioned a few weeks ago that we're introducing our kids to some classics of 80s cinema. This week it was Throw Mama from the Train. Do you remember that movie? It stars Billy Crystal as Larry Donner. He's a struggling author who teaches a writing class at a local community college or something. And his ever more and more comically awful relationship with Owen, played by Danny DeVito. Uh, Owen struggles with an overbearing mother. Larry struggles with his writing. The movie starts with Larry fretting over his typewriter. There we go. Um, this was before computers and word processors, so you see him trying to start his novel. The night was, the night was, he gets up, paces the room, he makes some tea, he looks back at the page. The night was, the night was hot, the night was sweltering, the, the night was hot and very sweltering, and, and he takes the page after page and he pulls it out of the typewriter and he crumples it up into a ball and he throws it away in the trash can. He can't find the right word. He, he just can't. And so he's stuck right there on that first sentence for what seems like eternity. Oh, the perils of writer's block for an author. And the next day he goes to class where students are reading their manuscripts and they're, well, not all that great. And he takes another one off the pile and he reads the very beginning of the next piece, and it's exactly the sentence that he'd been struggling over. The night is humid. And Larry's eyes grow big, and the camera zooms in on his expression. He can't believe it. He's going to be stuck here forever, and he ends the class for the day. 
The movie has its animating force right there as Larry is driven by his struggle to find the right words to have the story he's trying to tell sound just right. This is one of those weeks where I felt like Larry. I've started this Pentecost sermon three different times at least. It's been a crazy, emotional roller coaster of a week, if there ever was one. And that happens. And when that happens, you're trying to listen for the word of God in the middle of a cacophony of news, and, well, you just find yourself starting over more than once. The first sermon was going to invite you to listen to this. Yeah. <laughs> listen. Okay, so this audio clip was all the rage this week. It was on TV news programs and audio sh and radio shows and, of course, all over the Internet. It's been called the Laurel Yanny debate. What did you hear? Laurel. Okay. Some of you heard the word Laurel. Some of you heard the word Yanny, right? CBS News noted that this short audio clip is, quote, completely puzzling the world and pitting friend against friend. <laughs> Apparently, this whole thing started when Katie Hensel, who's a high school freshman, had a question about one of her vocabulary words, Laurel. And like any good, industrious, 21st century student, she looked it up. She went to vocabulary.com, and she played the audio file that pronounced it. But instead of the word in front of her, Laurel, Katie heard the audio say, Yanny. I asked my friends in, the, in my class, Katie said, and we all heard mixed things. She posted the audio clip to her Instagram, and another student published an online poll, Yanny or Laurel, and then someone else put it up on Reddit, and the next thing you know, Ellen is talking about it on her program, <laughs> and everyone is debating it around the dining room table. This clip is an example of a physiological and linguistic phenomenon. It has to do with the way that we hear different parts of the audio spectrum differently, in part, it's impacted by our age and the shape of our ears, and along with certain other clues, such as being told beforehand what to listen for, or changing the bass or the treble output of the audio, and we can hear different things in the same recording. If you tend to hear higher pitches more easily, you're more likely to hear Yanny. Otherwise, you might hear Laurel. Me, the first time I heard it, I thought it said Lammy. What do I know? <laughs> It reveals how we're all put together just a little bit differently, you and I. And more than this, how we can change over time as our bodies change with time and with age. Quote, if I took your ears off and put someone else's ears on your head, sounds would sound different, said Howard Nossbaum, a professor from the University of Chicago. Differently shaped ears focus sound differently you might actually hear sounds completely differently than the person sitting next to you. But maybe the most interesting thing throughout all of this was seeing how powerfully people reacted to this entire thing. What you hear, you hear. You hear Yanny or you hear Laurel. But some people seem to get quite defensive about what they hear. <laughs> Is that you? Is that? Okay. And more so, some people noted, they grow incredulous agitated when the people around them hear something completely different. <laughs> For instance, on the morning show CBS This Morning, co-hosts Nora O'Donnell, John Dickerson, and Gail King listened to the clip and started talking about it. O'Donnell and Dickerson both heard Laurel, King heard Yanny. And the debate got animated rather quickly. Quote, I don't know why I'm so personally offended by this, King said. <laughs> it's definitely, definitely, definitely Yanny. So there was the heart of the first Pentecost sermon this week, this huge debate over a silly internet file, the power of hearing things differently and what that does to us, between us. Some years ago, there was a picture of a dress <laughs> that did something similar. Some people, the dress is on the left, by the way, all the way on the left. And some people look at it and saw a black and blue dress. Some people look at it and saw a white and gold dress. Our bodies are such amazing things, are they not? 
And we have this tendency to assume that yours works the same way mine does, when they don't always do that. And when we realize that, it can lead us to question all sorts of things. And sometimes we get a little bit unsettled. Coming to a realization that we see things or hear things or process things differently can unsettle us. It can disrupt us. And instead of trying to take the extra time to clarify these differences, maybe seeking to understand them or to learn from them and to have compassion for one another and the fact that we seem to process life in our own little ways with our own nuances and particularities, the tendency for some of us is to get defensive and upset. Or to draw an image from this reading from the Acts, it makes us sneer at one another, accusing one another of being filled with new wine or otherwise not quite functioning at full speed, not working with a full deck. So maybe one takeaway from this story of Pentecost is our proclivity to distrust one another and what we say that we're experiencing, particularly when what you experience is different than what I experience. Maybe that's what you hear today when we read this ancient story about the movement of the Holy Spirit. I threw away that sermon sometime around the school shooting in Santa Fe, Texas. A 17-year-old took his father's shotgun and handgun and killed 10 classmates and students, wounding at least 13 others. It happened almost exactly three months after the Parkland, Florida shooting where 14 kids and three adults were killed. I've preached about gun violence before and about how these mass shootings, while only a small portion of the 32,000 firearm deaths in this country every year, most of those suicides are accidents, how these mass shootings tear apart our communities or our sense of safety, leading many people to go buy more and more guns even as violent crime in our country has significantly gone down over the last 20 years. It's almost numbing anymore. The way we keep going through this cycle of violence. One day a debate on Yanni and Lammy and another day this on the news. The burst of a demand that something change and then the realization that nothing is changing. We're stuck. Right there, we're stuck. We've had forums and town hall meetings. There are Facebook debates that too often bring out the worst in people. We talk past each other until the next mass shooting, the next trauma. I've been praying a lot about gun violence this year. For Parkland, for Santa Fe, Texas, for Center Schools this week, when they had the shooting in the parking lot after high school graduation over at the Church of the Resurrection. Thankfully, as I said, it looks like they're gonna be okay. We're not speaking the same language when it comes to this problem. We're not hearing one another when one person talks about victims, about trauma, and another talks about the Second Amendment and so-called God-given rights to open carry an AR-15 rifle to a rally where they're protesting gun violence. And if there were ever a time when I prayed for the Holy Spirit to come and to help get us all on the same page, to help us hear one another, and maybe maybe more importantly, to help us hear God's voice in the middle of all of this, it's been this week. Watching kids file out of another broken high school. That sermon got thrown away yesterday because of, of all things, a wedding I wasn't invited to, and even though it was televised, a wedding I wasn't even planning to watch. (laughs) Prince Harry met Meghan Markle on a blind date. Something remarkable in itself for an aristocratic heir to the British throne who had plenty of people trying to set him up with just the right partner. But Megan, the American biracial, once divorced former actress, was just the right partner for Harry. They are in love. And it led to a royal wedding with so much pomp and so much circumstance. There had been a lot of talk about how this wedding was disrupting a lot of tradition. Megan, uh, Markle didn't fit the mold. She wasn't British. She wasn't from a noble family. She wasn't white. She was married once before. Her family of origin, apparently, is contentious, like so many of us are. And with the British tabloids seeking the scoop of whether her father would even be there, that was the news. He wasn't. She walked herself down the aisle. 
None of that made me start my thinking over this week, however. That was all just royal drama. It was the testimony of the preacher that Harry and Meghan invited that did it. The most reverend Michael Curry is the head bishop of the Episcopal Church in the United States. It made some sense for him to preach at this service. St. George's Chapel at Windsor Castle is an Anglican church after all, and there was a great symbolic power in having an American preach at this marriage since it was a union of an Englishman and an American. His sermon is going to be the most famous sermon of the year, I promise you that. The eyes of the world were tuned in to that wedding, and Curry started preaching to them about the Holy Spirit, about the power of God, the power of love to turn this whole hurting world asunder, the power of love to make the wounded whole, the power of love to upend all this division and to make us one again. There's power in love, Curry preached. Don't underestimate it. Don't even over-sentimentalize it. There's power, power in love. If you don't believe me, think of a time when you first fell in love. The whole world seemed to center around you and your beloved. Oh, there's power, power in love. Not just in its romantic forms, but in any form, any shape of love. There's a certain sense in which you are loved and you know it. When someone cares for you and you know it, when you love and you show it, it actually feels right. There's something right about it. And there's a reason for it. The reason has to do with the source. We were made by a power of love, and our lives were meant, are all meant to be lived in that love. That's why we are here. Ultimately, the source of love is God himself, the source of all in our lives. And for a moment, the entire world stood mesmerized and amazed by the gospel, a word spoken. To those Brits, spoken in a strange American accent, sure, but a word spoken that everyone watching could understand, a word that for a moment unified people from all over the world, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Parphigia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya that belonged to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, Cretans and Arabs. For a moment, the whole world imagined what life could be like if love were at the heart of all we do, where no child would go to bed hungry, where justice would roll down like a mighty stream, where poverty would be history and the earth a sanctuary, where all swords and shields would be laid down by the riverside. That's Bible speak for firearms, in case you missed it. <laughs> where a world, would, a world in which there is good room, plenty good room for all. Curry called this love a fire, the stuff that burns hot with power to transform lives and to purify hearts and to set a community ablaze, the redemptive love of God, a fire that if humanity can capture it, will change the world. It's been that sort of week a cacophony of experiences, a babble of news, almost like we're trying to take a drink of water from a fire hose. In the lovely reading that Susan read for us, Paul put good language to all of this. For those of us who are sometimes trying to struggle over the typewriter of life, trying to understand what is going on, trying to find the right words to say, the right things to do, something that will make it all better, something that will heal the world. The world is aching in travail, Paul says, preparing to give birth to something new, a hope that is before us. And even if it's too much for us right now, so that we do not know what to do or how to pray or what to say or how to make things better, that very spirit of God intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words, with a love that passes all understanding with a hope that catches our attention and gives us a glimpse of a world where love is the way for all of us, where all the different people of the world can hear it and believe it and hope in it in their own wonderfully different and unique ways. What do you hear if you listen? 
carefully through the din of the world's news, what do you hear? There is the still, small voice of God weaving her way through our lives with a persistence that sometimes shouts in staid wedding chapels or through the perseverance and resilience of a broken, shot-up school community that leans on one another and declares, no, hate will not win, love will win. There's power in love, love will win. That's the power of Pentecost the power to pull us together into the church, to be God's people, to bear that witness, the power to help us navigate this noisy world, the power to help us hear what is deep and abiding and true and beautiful, and to go to make that our mission and our very way of life. May we, dear friends, be comforted by the lively, disrupting, lovely presence of God, even in the midst of our more hectic of weeks. And may we let that spirit blow through our lives this day, every day. May it be so.